first off. Thank you, Kip, for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you so, for having me. It is yeah. so cool to have you out here. I'm going to get some water uh, to drink because so, we're going to be talking a little bit. Um, well, first off, um, yeah, thanks for coming out. Mm. And, um, you know, I'd like to mm. just warm up. I, I just want to say something. Like, I noticed you're in shape. Mm. I feel like that's really oh. cool. I appreciate it. You, you, you working out regularly or what? <laughs> I do enjoy running or at least staying in shape. So, uh, I, you know. I have two young kids, so uh, I coach my daughter's high school softball team. So uh, I can't uh, I can't be out of shape and uh, expect them to, to work hard. So I do. So I I run a fair amount and uh, and I do a lot of push ups to uh, to stay at least a little bit fit. So all right, cool. So, and I like to eat Weight a lot. Training too, or a little bit, not yeah. a lot now. Um, less than in the past, but a little bit just to at least try to stay a little fit and uh, make sure that I, I don't hurt myself uh, doing all the fun things like moving tree stands around and dragon deer and that kind of stuff yeah yeah well exercise is so important mm -hmm. and for all sorts of things mm -hmm. for our health and being able to stay out in the woods and mm -hmm. for a long long time so i always like to see uh, people are taking that seriously mm -hmm. and i try to take it seriously too so oh, yeah um cool so we're here we have a map of we're at point pleasant farm 900 acre farm and it's sort of a playground for creating wildlife habitat and i um, excited to have you out here, just particularly to talk about deer, but also you have a lot of ideas. We were just touring the property, a lot of ideas about all sorts of other wildlife and how turkey and other things can mm -hmm. meld in with your deer habitat as well. So, um, so maybe we just start by, you know, we just took about an hour tour, hour and a half tour. We looked at all these different sites. Um, maybe some of the top level things that, that you saw mm -hmm. here at the site that are real opportunities for uh, for change on the property and, and um, feel free to describe what you see and, and how you might like, especially if you want to make it a, uh, an example an exemplar property mm. for wildlife management while maintaining the practical economic aspects of farming and forestry operations, uh, uh, the right balance, trying mm. to find that right balance between you know, managing for ecology, also maintaining some of your economic values of the property. Mm. Well, the first thing that, that really hits that comes to mind relative to taking a look at this is one, there's lots of opportunities. You know, there are parts of the world with just low productivity soil or, you know, maybe really short growing seasons that, that just don't lend themselves as well to others with regard to influencing vegetation to enhance, you know, management for whatever wildlife species is is the focal point. This part of the world, we have good soils we have very productive areas we have the ability from a forest end and an agricultural end to greatly influence the amount of food the amount of cover for different wildlife species so that's the first thing that, that hits me is um you have lots of opportunities here relative to whatever your goals may be to influence that wildlife in a positive manner whether that is something that's game species oriented like deer or turkey something non-game oriented you know maybe songbirds butterflies or, or other uh, um, things that we don't hunt, we don't chase around, or at least not with a fire, maybe we chase them with a camera, but um, there, there, there's a lot of opportunity here. And because of the productivity of the habitat and the climate, you know, opportunities to, to we have a high ceiling relative to, to, to what you're most interested in. Right, cool. Well, I was thinking, you know, an easy way to organize this discussion would also be to think about, I guess, basically the two big, land cover types we have on the map. We have, what we're looking at here is uh, a map of the 900 acre property. And it has, I would say two main categories. We have our forested areas. Um, we have one, two, three, four, five blocks of forests. One of those blocks, and they're all about maybe 50 acres or so, maybe a little bit bigger. One of them was harvested in 2016 and it's regrown. We went and took, the, took a look at that. So um, we have forests, we have, a lot of agricultural fields and we have hedgerows sort of splitting up a lot of our pretty nice hedgerows and cover in the middle of our agricultural fields. So maybe we'll start with the forests and think about like from a deer perspective, when you see a big block of forest like this, these are mature loblolly stands. They have some level of hardwood. There's some oaks in there, hollies and other things like that. Um, from what you saw when we drove through these forests, most of them are about the same age. They're all from a forestry perspective, mm. ripe for harvest. Um, they've got good timber in there. Uh, what would you do to manage these, um, not considering the economic aspect, but also to really try and maximize that for deer? 
Well, think of it from a deer end. The one thing that comes to, to mind immediately as we look at it on a map is, fortunately, they are spread out across the property. It's not all just one big forested area in a corner or even in the middle. The fact that our major blocks spread out adds value because from a deer habitat perspective, I really think of it as three components, a forested area, uh, old field or early successional vegetation area, and then food plots or agricultural end. So from the forest end, people often tie, or at least if you're in the Eastern United States, they tie deer to woods. They're like, you've got to have woods. And the, and the reality is that's not true. I mean, there's, there's some really good deer hunting in places like Kansas or South Texas, deer hunters dreams where there's not an overstory tree, you know, on the landscape. Mm -hmm. So deer don't need overstory trees. However, where we do have them, they certainly add value from a cover perspective. Um, if you're in any place that gets bad winter weather, they can provide a lot of winter cover, but too many forests in whitetail country are over mature and just don't provide that much food. Now, the good thing is we can influence that by having a variety of age classes in those woods so that we have some young stuff, we have some older trees, that's very easy to do. Um, and by doing so, we can make sure that yes, we have food for deer in there and we have cover. Um, you know, people think of acorns and apples and persimmons and other stuff, things that fall from trees as being good deer food, but most deer food in a forested area will grow from the ground up to about our eye level. That's, that's the food zone. Mm -hmm. So it's not stuff that's fallen out of trees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's use that as a benefit, but most of the food that as managers that we want to provide are stuff that grow within the zone, you know, that, that deer can eat. Right. So overstory forest or over mature forest, you know, there's very little of that. So in what we looked at today, you know, there's a lot of timber value in these, um, not a lot of food value from a deer end. So from a, from a deer's perspective, we could go in and open the canopy up in, in certain areas, allow more sunlight to hit the ground and let mother nature take care of that problem and actually provide more deer food for us right at ground level where deer can benefit most. Right, right. Now this is something that is common across mm -hmm. Maryland's forests. If we look at the age classes of our forests, mm -hmm. and, and you can look at this up in our state forest action plan, the bulk, I think, uh, maybe more than half of our forests are between 60 to 100 years old. And we have this sort of bottleneck of uh, that was probably the result of clear cutting mm. 60 to 100 years ago. And it's like the, with this sort of oversupply of mm. that age class mm. of trees, we have very few older than that. That's kind of a very small percentage of our forest and a very small percentage of a young forest. Mm. And that young forest that has all that vegetation at that young, at that uh, deer browse level, those first five mm. feet above the ground um, is exactly what you're describing mm. is like we have that problem commonly in maryland and i find you walk into most of our forests and it's leaf litter all over the ground mm. and you can take a walk like you're in the park you don't have to go around any bushes or uh -huh. climb over anything or even really worry about ticks because there's nothing brushing up mm. up uh, above your ankles right and so many people think "Ooh, this is park like this is great and for us it is pretty i'll be the first to admit yeah that looks nice um from a deer's end though yeah, that's an empty grocery store. So mm. very little food. Mm. They certainly would use those areas. They pass through them, but those are not areas that we're providing much food. And in areas that, in many cases, we're not providing much cover. It takes a lot of acres of that type of forest to even feed one deer for a mm. year. So that's mm. why you see folks who are managing habitat for deer. Sure, it's okay to have some of that, but let's mix that up and make sure we have some very young woods as well. Yeah, yeah. Cool. And we talked a little bit about the sizes that you might want to mm. think about creating these open canopy zones. So if you had, this is like a 60 acre block mm. of mature forest, what would you think about um, on, in terms of time and harvest and, and the types of like blocks you might consider for something mm. like that? I am a fan of five to 10 acre blocks. Um, anything less than five acres, while certainly usable by deer, um, is really too small to have, really be, have much of an impact. So it's not to say if you go out and enhance an acre or two acres, deer won't use it. They absolutely will. But if you get it to at least that five acre block, that's large enough now that, ooh, you're going to get way more use out of it. And at the same time, if you have a high density of deer, five acre block is usually enough that there's enough new vegetation that deer aren't eating at all. So like some of it is going to regenerate and become the next forest, which is what we're looking for. Small areas like that, they literally can consume it all. And then by doing work and trying to enhance habitat, what you essentially have done is just create an area where they come in and eat everything. So you ended up making things worse. Mm. 
simply because the scale wasn't big enough. Right. So I often right. think of a minimum of five acre blocks. Mm -hmm. You can go much larger than that. In the, in this part of the, the country though, thinking in, in that five to 10 acre scale works really, really well for most landowners. Cool, cool. And that mixes in with mm -hmm. uh, habitat for all the, all mm -hmm. sorts of other birds and things. I mean, I know a lot of our songbirds, they're finding that they used to think really needed mm -hmm. mature, uh, continuous mature forests. They're finding, oh, for their fledgling, mm -hmm. fledgling survival for their chicks, they need these small forest openings mm -hmm. in the middle of, of a forest mm -hmm. so that they can come down and get all these insects that mm -hmm. they need. And all that understory vegetation that grows in these little forest openings provides pollinators and butterflies mm -hmm. and all these other things that are coming in provides all your bird species, a lot of uh, a diversity of habitat. Mm. And like you said, the different age age classes and diversity of age structure mm. in our forest too. So cool. Um, now, uh, yeah, what else? Uh, anything else with forest? Now we have this this one uh, forested area that was clear cut. Um, most, actually it was a select, it was a select cut. I think they took out uh, most of the Lavalli pines and left all the oaks. Now something that happened, which is unfortunate, we left a lot of the oaks and the hardwoods, a preferred species, really for wildlife, mm. I think, was the goal for that. Um, and you can see here they left this border of mature trees along the edge because there, there's a known issue around here. When you do a cut and you leave trees um, sort of that used to be surrounded by a lot of pines, um, all of a sudden the pines are all gone and the trees are used to having this uh, sort of protection mm. from the rest of the forest. And what happened after that cut is a lot of those oaks fell over from wind, a windstorm. Um, knock them over and that's called wind throw mm. so we, we lost some of our oaks i think there's still quite a few in there but um, we we took a look at that and saw what was regenerating there um, and we talked about some of the ways in which you might manage like a recently cleared this is now seven years old dog hair thick in some mm. areas with uh, pine regeneration um, what does that provide for deer when you have a situation like that and how might you want to manage it also um, now that it's a say it's a 50 acre block mm. How do we add some diversity in there for deer? Well, the, the diversity is certainly important. And uh, in the eastern United States, and this, this varies by the amount of rainfall, but it, you know, in this part of the world, anytime that you cut a, a block that extensively and get on, you end up with really, really good deer habitat for seven to 10 years. What that means is you have food at the ground, you have cover at the ground, that is great. And after about year seven, somewhere in that seven to 10 year, that grows up so it's high enough now that suddenly it's shading things out again so you're back to the ground having very little food because no sunlight's getting there the problem is the trees aren't big enough to have any commercial value you know so that's when it's nice to be able to go in and either disturb that area again or part of it or be able to move that block to somewhere else so rather than having 50 acres like that i would rather have five to ten acres where we did it and then one, two, or five years later, take another part of that 50 acre section, five to 10 acres, do it again. That way you had always end up with forests that are zero to five years old, others that are five to 10, 10 to 20, et cetera. And by having that variety of age classes, you end up with very healthy forests that are going to benefit the whole suite of wildlife species mm -hmm. that are there. But at the same time, always providing the best of what deer need. So that that is where that's important. Yeah. Now, what we looked at there, there was some great cover in there and that was providing really really good uh, cover for deer and as you saw you know they could still maneuver through yeah. it wasn't so thick that they can't get in there and it, it's possible to be too thick some folks will say it, the thicker the nastier the better that, that's not true if it's that thick and deer can't maneuver it easily they'll use the perimeter of it as well but they're not going to use it all so i liked how that looked where yeah you couldn't see more than 10 to 20 yards of that but you were able to move through so provides very good cover, but it's at a stage now where, you know, there's almost nothing on the forest floor again. Mm -hmm. So if we had, we could either have another block nearby with food on the floor, or we could go back in and do some type of disturbance in there. We could run a fire through it. We could take a bulldozer through it and crush some of that. We could do something to just disturb that so that we returned some of that to year zero. Right. So we start with a successional stage at that again, but it's that type of disturbance that's periodically needed that ensures we have that variety of age classes meeting uh, a deer's needs. Yeah, cool. Now we saw almost all the farm fields here, uh, with the exception of of these right here, um, are in soybeans this year. Um, 
a lot of these that weren't planted in soybeans are currently in clover patches because uh, there are such high densities of deer on the property that they can't even grow a crop there. Mm -hmm. They sort of throwing away their, their seed by planting things there. The deer come in and really uh, knock it out. Um, so yeah, let's turn from the forest now to the agricultural lands mm -hmm. and think about, you know, what are some of the things, um, if, if soybeans are being grown there now, predominantly, we have a lot of pretty nice hedgerows for a little bit of cover and, and travel corridors undercover. Um, but what might you think about if, uh, and we also, I'll, I'll note, we have a couple of clover fields that have been really well maintained. White clover um, is the dominant uh, food plot species that has been planted here traditionally in the past. Now it's under, we're, we're trying to think of new things we can do. Um, what kind of things would you think about for these open agricultural mm -hmm. areas, um, both food plot wise or other types of habitat? Well, I think if you, you bring a good point up relative to the deer numbers on the property and we can't grow soybeans, so we're doing something else. That is one thing it's important for whoever the manager is, the landowner or somebody else managing this, whether it's private land or public land, it's important to, to, to balance the deer herd with what the habitat is providing. And so it doesn't matter if the habitat can support 10 deer or 100 deer or 1,000 deer, let's have that number on. Let's not have 2,000 deer on something that can only support 1,000. So while we want to be working from the habitat end to enhance that, we also need to be managing the deer herd. And that, that's something we can never forget because we cannot produce good enough habitat at a scale if we're not also managing the deer. End. And in areas where we have better uh, habitat quality and higher production, that means we just have higher productivity in the deer herd as well. So it's always a battle to be working at it from both ends. Well, this is a good chance right. to talk about the four mm. cornerstones mm. that NDA has mm. for, for deer management. What are, what are those? They are herd management. So we got to yep. manage the deer herd habitat management so let's enhance what we have here hunter management which means hey let's make sure hunters are more knowledgeable about deer but also about their responsibilities as a hunter in that in many cases to harvest enough antlerless deer um, and the last is herd monitoring Let, mm -hmm. let's collect information from the deer herd and the habitat if we can so that we are doing as good a job as possible managing that area right. and that type of data is like herd health indices like body weights by age class and you know fat stores on deer so we can measure hey do we have enough food for the deer or then there's more deer than we really have food mm -hmm. for you know we need to we need to do a better job reducing numbers or increasing the quality of habitat or ideally both right okay so let's let's finish mm -hmm. this um part on the agricultural side and what to do with these ag mm -hmm. fields and then i think that a really cool way to move mm -hmm. forward is, is to go back to all four of those cornerstones we're sort of on one right now is mm -hmm. habitat improvement and then maybe touch a little bit on maybe the other three and and hear about those things because i yeah. have some definite questions on monitoring mm -hmm. and we have uh we have the, an agreement with the foundation uh to manage this property and thinking about yeah how we're going to measure these deer so let's let's get to that uh, we'll, we'll come back to that but um, the agricultural fields, yes, you're saying we need to be thinking, okay, when we're putting these into production, we need to also think about herd size. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but if let's just say we know we've got, uh, we've got a low enough population, we want to provide some more food resources. Um, you know, what are some of your favorite things mm -hmm. like between food plots versus more natural sort of early successional mm -hmm. or old fields? You talk about maybe even define early successional for the audience if they haven't heard of that yet. And and maybe talk about some of your food plot uh, preferences. Okay. Yeah, let's talk about the old fields first. So uh, when we started, we mentioned the three components of deer habitat, forests, old fields, and then food plots. So the old fields, these are areas that are agricultural fields or just fields that maybe used to be pasture um, that are not being actively planted in anything anymore. So we're not planting corn or soybeans or clover or alfalfa, whatever. We're not planting those. However, it's not woody vegetation. So old fields are ones that have early successional vegetation, which means it's herbaceous rather than woody. It's not trees, it's not even young trees, it's herbaceous, so it's plants. So it's things that if we ultimately stop managing it, it will succeed and become trees or become woody in most parts of the country, especially here. So we don't want it to become woods, but we're not actively planting a crop there every year. The good thing about it is, those native plants that are herbaceous. And people think of like flowering plants. These are things, you know, like often things that we name as weed. These are ragweed, jewelweed, you know, uh, bone set, uh, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. a bunch of the desmodiums. So it's a bunch of wild flowering plants that pollinators love, that people like to look at because they're pretty. Mm -hmm. But the fact that they're broad leaf means that the nutritional content is way higher than the grass nutritional content for deer. Mm -hmm. And it also means then that they can provide good cover as well as good food for deer. We're not paying to plant them. So food plots are very expensive. And you know we can talk about food plots right. next. We're not buying the seed. In most cases, we're not fertilizing these. Eggs. We're allowing the seed bank to show us what it has simply by removing that carpet that's over top of that mm -hmm. and just letting the sun hit the ground and go. So this is great for deer. Uh, it's great for a whole suite of other wildlife species. And the important thing is that it's really good food and cover, but it's also good food and cover at the critical time of year when deer need it the most. And it's a time when we were providing less food in woods or in the forest, and we're providing less food from a food plant. In. So yeah. it fills that gap. So it's absolutely perfect from a deer management end. What's the timing in the year? I'm going to pause and make sure mm -hmm. this thing is running. Um, so we'll be able to clip this out. Make sure this is still recording because this is really good stuff. Should we go in here? Yes, we are. 21 minutes in, and we're still working. Good deal. Let me make sure it's lined up. It's good. Mm. Looking buff, man. I'm oh, loving oh. it. I need get, I've had like a hiatus. I was working out like five, five to six days a week. I'm mm. really doing good. And like, I've had like two, three days where I haven't worked out. Oh. And I'm like, it's slippery. It's slippery when I start yeah. doing it. <laughs> you know, I'm like, just gone two days. Right. Now, on my third day, I'm like, if I, if I let another day go, uh, it's like real easy to all of a sudden it turns into a week, yeah. two weeks, and then you start getting soft. Yeah. Um, anyways, uh, cool. So Loved hearing. So let's get back. You're just talking about old fields. Oh, the, the critical the time, time period. period. So when is that time period that an old field is going to provide food that might not, might have gaps elsewhere? That it, many people talk about making sure we have food for deer during the fall because that's when they like to hunt them or even during the summer because that's when they think of antlers growing. But the most energetically expensive time of the year for deer is spring and early summer. That's when bucks start growing antlers, but it's also when does are at the end of their pregnancy and fawns are hitting the ground. And when does have, are lactating, that is the by far the most expensive thing that deer do. It takes way more energy mm -hmm. to, to produce a lot of milk than it does to grow antlers. And those are happening in, in this part of the world in May. Well, antlers start growing in April, that last trimester of pregnancy is in April. So April, May, and into June, the habitat should be absolutely rocking. And now there's probably some food plotters sitting here thinking, I don't even plant my food plots until May or till May or June. Or yeah, I plant soybeans. That's great. Well, you're planting them in April or May. They're not providing anything until late May or June. So right. that critical time period is that spring and then into summer. That's when old fields are carrying the lion's share mm -hmm. of, of what the deer herd needs uh you know th they have evolved to be green up plants when it's green up they're growing it's way before yeah. other stuff is so it's free to us it's at the right time of the year yeah. deer love it and it also provides good cover yeah. so it's, it's a win-win all the way around and all the pollinators are there mm -hmm. this is also oh. a, a big part of what i work on is early successional habitat mm -hmm. for quail bobwhite quail which mm -hmm. has declined across so much of their range we are working hard to educate people about the benefits of early successional right. habitat for quail and bringing them back uh, as well as a suite. All of our pollinators have gone through mm. so many declines. So there's, there's these sort of like triple benefits to these types of habitats. Mm. And it's the least cost, least intensive one to manage for. Um, so, and, and also, yeah, when you mentioned the energetic needs of a, of a doe, it is interesting. You'd think like third trimester of a pregnancy would be the time in which mm. it needs the most. And it does need the most for the pregnancy but after that fawn drops, if you look at the charts for how much energy a no. doe needs, it's like it really almost fifty percent more than what their baseline mm. maintenance is, and sometimes even almost some people mm. have said almost double mm. the amount of energy needed to be able to uh, feed a growing fawn mm. and herself, of course. Mm. Um, so yeah, uh, really important yeah. time of year. Um, well, when people, you know, that's one of the cool things about deer is you know they breed in the fall, but then they go into winter when it's most limiting from a nutritional standpoint. Mm -hmm. So white tails put almost no energy into that pregnancy during the first and second trimesters. Mm -hmm. It's not till the third trimester. Mm -hmm. And when does the third trimester start? Man, it correlates almost perfectly with green up. Yeah. You know, mother yeah. nature knows what they right. need to do. Yeah. So it's that third trimester. That's when almost that whole fetus is developed. Mm -hmm. And then when that fawn hits the ground, people forget that 
how good of a start that fawn has is going to play a large role in you know, like how much of its genetic potential does it live up to right. body size antler growth etc and from a doe's end you take a doe that's well fed versus a doe that's starving the quality of their milk is exactly the same so it's not like she has better milk by getting fed more but the difference is by being fed more she produces way more milk yeah. That's the difference. Right. So a fawn whose mom is starving, that fawn gets just as high quality milk, but they only get a little bit right. of it. A fawn whose mother's well fed gets a lot, and that's what makes the difference, giving them that huge jump start on life. That spring is when all that starts. So mm -hmm. that's why I say that's when the habitat needs to be rocking. Right. And then this part of the world, the best way to make that is those early succession of vegetation out in those old fields. Cool. Now where we are, um... In the Mid Atlantic region, we have pretty abundant rainfall, and our old fields will pretty quickly turn into mm. young forests, mm. and we'll have saplings growing up. Oftentimes, of sometimes tree species that are a little bit weedy, don't provide a lot mm. of habitat. How uh, sweet gums, for example, are kind of a notorious mm. one, as well as some of our invasives like uh, calorie pear is a known kind of problem uh. in in, uh, in some of these early successional fields. What are some of the tools that a landowner might think about using to keep that, that habitat good and high quality food? Great question, because that is the biggest concern that many landowners have. Like, I don't want it to go back to woody. You know, they may bush hog it or do something which removes the value of that early success of vegetation because they are fearful that it's going to go woody. This part of the world, you list of the species. I work with folks a little bit further west that the, the species are honey locust and Osage orange or hedge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Big thorns, nasty, nasty stuff. You know, landowners do everything possible to keep those out. So the good thing is it's pretty easy to maintain these fields in early successful vegetation to keep them from going woody. The, the easiest way is if you have the ability to use prescribed fire. Mm -hmm. Once every three to seven years, depending on rainfall, we can burn, keep those out. Mm -hmm. If you can't use fire or you don't want to use fire, we also have the ability to use herbicides. Mm -hmm. um, we also have the ability to use disking and specifically disking during the dormant season, mm -hmm. you know, to keep those out. Um, we do have the ability to mow, although mowing is not as good for wildlife as yep. the other. But if that's the only thing that you have, we can do that as well. Or what most people use is a combination of those. Yeah. So uh, I'm, I'll be the first to say I love the woods that I manage. I love the early successional vegetation that I manage. And as much as I like the woods, I absolutely do not want to see the woods in those other areas. Right. So, so I get it. Um, right. And um, so yeah. I will maintain them in that early successional vegetation because that's so much more food than our woods provide. So, right. um, And I fully understand landowners' concerns of that. But it's pretty easy to keep it in that. Mm -hmm. And it's not even something that you have to do every year, yeah. so, which makes it nice. So it allows you to influence a lot of acres. And while people might be concerned, oh, I got to do this maintenance for early succession habitat. Uh, we talked a little bit about, well, mm. compared to a food plot, mm. how does that mm. how does that maintenance of a prescribed fire or disking or herbicide treatments, mm. how does that compare for your, uh, in terms of labor and time and cost compared to a food plot? It, it is a, you will spend a fraction of the amount of time on early succession of vegetation as you do on food plots. And so for example, I'm, I'm a big food plot fan as well. We plant 20 to 25 acres each year. Um, I spend way more time on a one acre food plot, spraying, no-till drilling, fertilizing. Um, I will spend more time on a one acre food plot on an annual basis than I will on a 20 acre early mm. successional mm. vegetation field or a 20 acre old field. Right. So from a time perspective, I am providing so much more food in that 20 acre field, mm. so much more cover. And the thing is, it's free to me. Right. You know, I'm paying for the herbicide, right. the seed, the fertilizer in that one acre food mm -hmm. plot. So I will spend more money there than I will managing 20 acres of old field. And I'll yeah. spend more time on a one acre food plot than 20 acres of old field. So yeah. it's, it is a way bigger bang for your buck relative to enhancing habitat going that old field route. Cool. Now, I want to dig in a couple mm -hmm. on, on these, not too much deeper, but um, on prescribed fire here in Maryland. Uh, I just for anybody listening, the Maryland Forest Service mm -hmm. is the primary conduit to get started to learn about how would I even think about getting started. I've never mm -hmm. done a prescribed burn. Where would you go? The Maryland Forest Service has an active program to get landowners into it, and they can advise you on how to move forward mm -hmm. and what to do and all the logistics that go into that. Now, in other states, you work also all other places. Is it usually the forest state's Forest Service is a good place to go to learn about prescribed fire? Or 
where would a landowner go who's never played with fire to, to that, go? That is always a good place to start. Um, I'm a huge fan of fire. Um, I'm from Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And actually, I am the, the vice chair of the Pennsylvania Prescribed Fire Council. Um, and we there is a, quite a bit of burning that's done on public land in Pennsylvania now. There's a lot of private landowners that want to use fire. That That is a push that the fire council has is to get it used more in private mm -hmm. land. So in Pennsylvania, the way it works is landowners are allowed to burn. Mm -hmm. If you're a Pennsylvania, you absolutely can burn. But if you lose the fire, you have no protection. Mm -hmm. So that's what keeps most people from doing that. Right. In Pennsylvania, it's governed by DCNR, which is the Department of, of Conservation and Natural Resources. Um, so wherever state you're in, your Forest Service or your state forest warden or your state wildlife agency, somebody that you make that connection and uh, they will be able to guide you to who the correct agency is in that state because they do vary by state. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, and then disking, you mentioned mm -hmm. specifically dormant season disking, and I just want to emphasize that and why dormant season mm. versus um you know early spring march april mm. what's what's the benefit of that sort of dormant season that time? really is species specific what you're managing for so with respect to deer in general deer don't want to eat grasses specifically perennial cool season grasses the exceptions being the cereal grains oats wheat or rye of course corn and sorghum are grasses but for the most part deer don't want grasses they want broadleaf plants those forbs so in many cases, anything that we do from a deer end to remove grasses and replace them with forbs is a net positive for deer. Mm -hmm. So with disking, if you disturb the soil during the growing season, you encourage grasses. So if your goal is to have more grasses, maybe you're a cattleman or maybe you're managed for something, a grassland bird species, disk during the, the growing season. If you disturb the soil during the dormant season, you encourage more forbs. Mm -hmm. So that's why I say from a deer end, Dormant season disking in these old fields will help reduce the percentage of grasses that are there, increase the percentage of forbs that are there. So that will benefit deer yeah. greater than doing something to uh, encourage grass. Yeah, yeah. And we've seen that, uh, especially yeah. uh, especially for bob white habitat. That's another, another mm -hmm. carry on that, again, we have these sort of benefits to multiple species. Um, that fall and dormant season sort of, I mm -hmm. guess, anywhere from, I don't know, now, maybe in a month or so, get your disc in and try and get in but probably by the end of february start getting into march april you start to see more of those mm. grasses start to crop and pop in um, at, from a disking treatment so um, and that also is those forbs those broadleaf uh, plants and wildflowers also great for for our bob white quail uh, meadow larks are a different story mm. they they will like that very heavy grass component there's uh, grasshopper sparrows also might kind of prefer some mm. of those heavier grass components but um certainly if you're looking for Deer, bobwhite quail, and things like that. I think that fall yeah. season, fall dormant season disking is is an important tool. Um, cool. And uh, now maybe uh, you mentioned herbicides, and maybe we can use herbicides to also transition us to to uh, the food plot side of things because I know some of the same herbicides might be a use uh, useful tool mm. there. So um, you mentioned grasses are kind of like kind of the enemy. I mean, I like grasses. I'm, mm. I'm a, I used to be a range guy. I still am a range mm. guy in a lot of ways, and um, but uh, grasses aren't providing a lot of nutrition for deer, um, and they can certainly um, kind of take over sometimes. So how do you, or woody, so how, what kind of um, herbicides would you use for uh, an old field or early successional field? And then how would that also maybe those same herbicides transition us into the, the ones you would use for a food plot? Well, there's lots of herbicides that we can use in an old field variety or ver environment. And um, we'll talk about that first one, and we can do food plots next. Cool. But it, it will depend on what we're starting with what vegetation is there, which herbicides we would select to then to that influence that. And in general, there, there are some herbicides that are broad spectrum, means we spray them, they kill everything that's there, mm -hmm. or almost everything. There's others that kill just broadleaf plants and not grasses. There's others that will kill just grasses and not broadleaf plants. So the, the easiest way to start with, say, an old pasture that's dominated by cool season grasses, to get it to early successful vegetation for deer, the, the least expensive and easiest way to do that is to wait until after a couple of frosts in the fall. And at that point, many of those broadleaf plants have gone dormant, but those cool season grasses are growing like crazy. Like right now. Right, right now. now. Yeah. And then we can spray that with glyphosate, which is one of the least expensive things available. It's one of the safest things available. Mm -hmm. And then there's no soil act activity after that. It's just mm -hmm. on the plant. 
-hmm. So what that will do is that'll kill those cool season grasses this fall. Next spring, it allows the broadleaf to get a better start on what's there. That is a great way to do it. If somebody's listening to this in the spring and say, sounds great, but I want to start right now. I don't want to wait until this fall. Um, Plateau is an herbicide that is great. That will kill a bunch of the grasses we don't want, but also kill some of the broadleafs we don't want, like horse nettle. Hmm. Horse nettle is a, a terribly invasive plant. No good for deer. It's no good for, for most wildlife. I don't. Mm -hmm. So the plateau will kill that as well. We can spray that in the spring and get a mm -hmm. jump start. So there, there's a variety of ones that are that are very safe to use. You don't need a license for them. I don't spray anything that I need a license for. Mm -hmm. I get everything just over the counter. So because I want to be environmentally you know, uh, friendly as well, or mm -hmm. is it a, a Ken? So with yeah. that, there's there's a there's a handful of herbicides that the majority of people using this are going mm -hmm. to use mm -hmm. that work very well and are very safe for the environment and then provide some options relative to what time of the year are you using. Right. So you mentioned, so glyphosate, broad spectrum, uh, plateau, mm -hmm. which is another one we use for mm -hmm. some of our quail habitat because mm -hmm. it knocks, it also is uh, a lot of our warm season native grasses are resistant to mm -hmm. plateau. So you can keep your bluegrass, uh, your, so your uh, big blue stem, little mm -hmm. blue stem, and several of uh, Indian grass will stay in there as well. They can handle um, some of that. Um, so that's that's another one. Um, now we hadn't talked yet on the grass specific herbicides. Mm. So you mentioned uh, we talked a little bit about one. What are your what are your kind of top grass specific ones? The the two uh, most well known grass selective herbicide, which means kills grasses but no broadleaves, are clethodim. That's the active ingredient, and post. And of those two, th this is one of these things. This almost never happens. Research university research trials show clethodim is actually a little better than post mm. and it's way less expensive. Mm. Like anything that's better always costs more. <laughs> right. This is the one case where clethodim is actually cheaper and it, and it works better at killing grasses. So yeah. we would use that in a food plot scenario where we have a broadleaf plant like clover or alfalfa or soybeans, mm -hmm. um, where if we have grass weeds, we also can use that in our old fields where Maybe we have a bunch of grasses in there that we want to, to be able to kill those and just allow you know, more of the broadleafs to take over. So yeah. definite, definite applications in a couple different uh, vegetative yeah. communities there that, that we can use that. Yeah. And for anybody listening, also make sure you read the label. Mm -hmm. Take time to read mm -hmm. the label. Um, uh, I like to also, usually, I'm not sure if it's always in the label, but I like to look at the half-life mm -hmm. of the herbicide and be cognizant of how long that chemical is going to be in the environment. Uh, Roundup which is glyphosate and has sort of a bad rap in the news sometimes, but it's got one of the shortest half-lives um, of a lot of the herbicides mm. out there. It's, I think, in the order of a week or two for a half-life, so it really dissipates in the environment pretty quickly from UV exposure and, and other things, whereas some, other, some of these other ones have much longer half-lives. Just something to be aware of. Mm. If you want to plant a field back into crops for whatever reason, um, I know plateau is pretty hard if you if you're in an area where you're growing peanuts i remember reading them the label mm. you can't plant back peanuts the year after you use plateau mm. it has a relatively long uh, half-life and so that's that's good because it keeps mm. a lot some of those weeds mm. you want out it yeah. has a sort of residual activity and keeps them down especially if you have like really noxious like hard to control invasives mm. um but it's something to be aware of that to, to always read that label i have made mistakes i'm going to confess <laughs> i have killed plants i killed a small fig tree in my front yard um, <laughs> I didn't read the label very carefully. So um, please do that. Um, and if you're going to do it, especially be cognizant of the uh, of the rainfall. Make sure, especially if any of these things wash into waterways, um, it can be really, really uh, hmm. horrific for some of our amphibian populations and other things. So uh, I'll, I'll get off that soapbox um, right now, but just want to emphasize that at all times um, that we're using these things responsibly. So, um, so what else? Okay, so we're now food plots. Food plots. Um, yeah, we got a few white clover fields here. Mm -hmm. um, and some very nice white clover yeah. fields. Some Javier, really, really nice Javier looking. did a good job on that one. It's like, it's really clean. From I'm a food plot fan, um, and I will say this. Most people overestimate the value of food plots. And by what I say, what I mean is they're certainly valuable for feeding deer, and you can hunt over them, or you can take pictures of deer over them but they put too much emphasis on trying to use food plots to provide too much of the food that the deer herd needs. Mm. And if you try to carry a deer herd with food plots alone, boy, in most cases you're gonna fail simply because we can't control mother nature. You can do everything right, planning, but if we don't get them enough rain or we get too much rain, you know, they, so what I tell people is, hey, do work in the woods, manage your old fields, 
provide enough food in those environments to carry the deer herd, then use your food plots to just supplement. You know, so that's just over the top, mm-hmm. making sure they get what they need. Mm-hmm. So from that, um, I am a fan of making sure that we can provide year or food as close to year round as possible in food plots. And there's really three components of species that we'll plant. We have cool season perennials, things that do really well in the spring, die out a little in the summer, do good in the fall, but then not much food in the winter. These are most of the clovers, red clover, white clover, alfalfa, chicory, those things. So I like to plant, take some of my food plot crop and plant that. Mm -hmm. The next component is warm season annuals. These are things we think of as farmers, corn, sorghum, soybeans can provide a lot of forage during the summer and fall and in the winter until they're gone, but nothing in the spring. Mm. So I you put some into that. The last are cool season annuals. These are either the cereal grains, oats, winter wheat, winter rye, or brassicas. Things like you know turnips, rape, kale, radishes, canola, they get thrown all in there. I don't mix all that stuff together in any one, but by making sure that I have some food plots in cool season perennials, some in warm season annuals, and then some in cool season annuals, that allows me to provide food for as close to 12 months mm-hmm. of the year as possible yeah. so that I'm supplementing what I'm providing in my woods and my old fields. And by doing so, the deer herd does way better. Mm-hmm. Um, I always have something to be able to hunt over in the fall, which mm-hmm. is nice. But at the same time, I'm being a little more responsible steward of the natural resources and you know making sure that something's available for more than just a month. Right, right. Cool. So now we've kind of covered, I think, that first cornerstone Mm -hmm. of the QDMA or the NDA um, Mm -hmm. component, which is habitat management. Now, we talk a little bit about herd management. Now, this this is a really unique property. Um, I don't know when it was fenced, but there is a this property is a giant peninsula, 900 acre peninsula, essentially. And it has a fence that essentially, I think, probably limits almost all deer movement Mm -hmm. across it. Um, so we have a closed population here, which is really interesting for a lot of wildlife research reasons. Um, but because of that, it also gives us some challenges. Like mm-hmm. when you think about, uh, the herd on this property, it hasn't been hunted, uh, very heavily, hardly at all, maybe a deer or two, maybe three or four or five a year on 900 acres, which is essentially mm-hmm. zero. Um, uh, in terms of the scale of things, it's a, it's a, a small percentage of the, of the heart of the total population. Um, what would you think about? Uh, with harvest on this property, um, finding out, um, sort of managing this herd, especially given that we have this containment fence, um, I think gives us a lot of opportunities for some neat things, um, but also maybe some challenges. What what do you think in terms of, we saw the browse lines out there in some of these mm-hmm. forests, um, and obviously a lot of deer damage on some of our, these crop fields. Yeah, this part of the country produces a lot of deer. Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Delaware, year in and year out, shoot more deer per square mile than every other state in the country. Wow. So from the productivity end, that's pretty cool. We get to see a lot of deer. From the responsibility end means we have to remove a lot of deer as well, Mm -hmm. particularly in an area like this that's just so productive from Mm -hmm. a soil and agricultural standpoint. Mm -hmm. So with that, um, the fence probably does limit a lot of movement. They certainly can jump it. Mm -hmm. Being a peninsula, water can inhibit it, but Boy, deer can swim a long way, I'm so there's sure probably there yep. is some movement, I'm sure, on and off. Mm-hmm. But I bet you're right. I bet you, you know, there's a there's a a relatively closed deer herd here, which is a lot of deer based on what we saw in the fields and in the woods. So the exact number of deer that should be removed each year, we could run some some calculations and, and come up with a ballpark figure. But the re- way to really figure that out is whatever that number is for this year, it would be a little different next year. Mm-hmm. We need the habitat and we need the deer herd to tell us what that is. Mm-hmm. And the way we get that information is by when we do harvest some deer, we weigh them. And let's look at the inside. Let's look at particularly the kidney fat. Huh. Deer that are well fed when they're harvested in the fall, the interior of the body should be full of fat. Hmm. The kidneys should be entirely encased in fat. When you remove the hide, there should be a layer of fat all the way down the back. Hmm. That is a deer that's well fed, and well prepared to go into winter. You take deer off properties that there are more deer than there is food. Kidneys have no fat around them. There's no external layer of fat around the Mm -hmm. outside of the meat. So Mm -hmm. that lets us know there's too many deer. Mm -hmm. It doesn't tell us if there's five deer too many or a hundred deer too many, but it tells us there's too many. Mm -hmm. So as managers, we want to start removing some deer each year, enhance habitat. But then when we harvest those deer, let's collect that information. Let's make sure we weigh them, look at how much fat is internal, 
and uh, from the habitat, let's look, hey, when we try to grow something, let's put an exclusion cage up and it better be as tall outside or almost as tall as it is inside or deer are, you know, are, are being negatively impacted, they're just eating that to the ground. Mm -hmm. So there's ways that we can just read or monitor the habitat and monitor the deer to let us know and let them tell us, mm -hmm. yes, we have enough food for the number of deer here or not. Well, this gets to that other cornerstone, it's like a nice uh, segue, is the monitoring of mm -hmm. the herd. And uh, I, I've heard you on previous podcasts mm -hmm. with others and other great um, educational things that I've listened to that I'd recommend anybody just mm -hmm. Google Kip Adams podcast, you'll learn a lot. Um, but I think you were on Land and Legacy talking about the different aspects of uh, using both camera surveys mm. and observational surveys. Uh, I think those were the two that you really highlighted during that interview. And um, I was wondering if we could dig in. I think at, during that interview, I think you said one camera per 100 acres. So mm. this is a 900 acre property. Um, you know, how would we get that in? So I've got a couple of cameras already out. We're going to probably uh, randomize and we'll put some more out across the rest of the, of the farm. Um, there's a not only getting them out, but then I was really curious, having put a lot of cameras out mm. and familiar with the thousands of camera images mm. that come in and the sort of <laughs> cost of time of going through them all. Like, how do you manage your, not only how would you put them out there, but also how do you manage all the data? Uh, are you using any tools? We're using something called Wildlife Insights. I don't know mm. if you ever heard of it. It's it's using AI tools to start to categorize deer pictures and deer pictures. Mm. It's not perfect, but it gets you... It does a lot. No. It'll clear out all the blank camera images for you. That, that alone is very helpful. A lot, or, or vehicles <laughs> driving by or whatever. It's like vehicles, yeah. so you can just toss those. But um, yeah, I'd love to hear a little bit about that methodology and, and uh, what you sort of how you do your observational, uh, your camera, and then we'll talk about observation. Well, the camera surveys that I talked about, uh, it's a, a formalized survey technique developed by Dr. Harry Jacobson at Mississippi State University, gosh, almost 30 years ago now. Um, we have conducted an annual summer camera survey on our farm in northern Pennsylvania every year for the last 20 years. And uh, it is a way to then estimate the number of different bucks, does, and fawns you use in the property. It's not exact, but it gives you an estimate of it. And then as long as you're consistent with conducting that survey at the same time each year and with the same number of cameras, it allows you a really good feel for is the deer herd increasing or decreasing. And then also then, since you have pictures of bucks, you can estimate how the age structure of those bucks are and antler quality or whatever. So the, the, the technique is essentially a two week survey using one camera for every hundred acres um, put out. And this is a baited camera survey. So you're putting some type of bait out to draw them to these areas. Mm -hmm. You're then taking pictures of all those deer for two weeks. You then count the number of buck pictures, the number of doe pictures and fawn pictures. Um, you can tell the bucks apart based on antlers or mm -hmm. you know physical features or whatever. So based on the ratio of number of different buck photos, different bucks in the total buck photos, mm -hmm. gives you a ratio that you can then use to estimate, okay, how many likely different does or fawns we have. Right. That works great in areas where you can put bait on the ground. Um, I'm lucky where we are, we can do that. However, the problem is there's an increase in number of places you can't do that mm -hmm. because as CWD continues to spread. So there's a lot of really smart people at different universities trying to develop a non-baited camera mm -hmm. survey technique. Mm -hmm. um, they don't have it perfect yet, but they're at least moving in that direction. But if you can use that baited survey, that is a great way. And that's what we have used year after year to then estimate the number of deer on our farm. So from that, then I calculate a target antlerless harvest that we have. So before day one of our deer season every year, we know exactly this is how many does we want to take to meet our objectives, whether it be to allow our deer herd to grow or if we need to reduce it or, or whatever it is, it's a, it works really, really well to estimate the approximate number of deer mm -hmm. on that area. And do you do all the re camera uh, photo review yourself or do you have I some do. friends? Do you have, uh, I do, but or? I fully understand the value of, of having help with that. Yeah. And, um, and I have hoped for a long time that, uh, that AI will mm -hmm. be able to not only, because now it can tell, yes, these are bucks or these are does or these are cars, but needed to tell the different bucks apart. Yeah. So that's that's the time consuming part. Yep. But one thing with this, as I said, a camera per hundred acres, if you have larger properties, maybe you don't have that many cameras or you simply don't have the time, you can just sample a subset of the property. Mm -hmm. So for example, you know, I use five cameras on ours. If say I only had three cameras, I could just survey that part of it 
and um, you know, and use that. So, so get a good sense of so it. So this yeah. is 900. If you have the ability to put out nine cameras and analyze the data, great. Yeah. If not, use half that many or right. whatever you can to at least get some, right. because the amount of time to analyze photos, it's it it's a lot of fun the first few years, and then yeah. it can become yeah. like work if, yeah. if you're getting too many photos. I one of one of my dissertation chapters, which I ended up oh. publishing in the Journal of Wildlife Management, mm -hmm. was using a method of camera traps um, on, we used uh, an MCMC -MC algorithm. Mm. Uh, you know, it's it was uh, a Bayesian framework and now I'm going back like five, <laughs> six years now. And it was, yeah, it, it took me, I mean, granted going through the peer review published process mm. takes like, it took over a year. So by the time I got the results, mm. it was like three years later mm. and like, who cares? The deer population has moved on by then. Oh. So it's kind of tough in that situation. Um, but certainly, I think uh, technology is definitely getting there. I actually mm -hmm. shared some of our identified bucks with a machine learning uh, group to see, yeah, could you guys actually see? Because mm -hmm. we got we had them all classified so they could train the model. And it worked okay, but I don't think it was quite there yet mm -hmm. to, the, to the different angles. But I have a feeling it is coming. Mm -hmm. um, if it can tell the difference between me and my brother in a picture, it's, yeah. it's coming, right? <laughs> I, I hope so. And, I, and I'm the biggest fan of that. I, yeah. I, am, I yeah. am looking forward to the day yeah. um, um, that I can do that. Yeah, well, cool. So we got, uh, so, and then you mentioned observational studies. And that, this yeah. is a great thing and, and like a cool thing also just for, to enhance people's awareness and, and track some things. Talk right. about how you guys. I'm a, I'm a big fan of observation surveys. And the nice thing about those is one, it doesn't cost anything. And it doesn't even cost you any time because an observation survey is every day that you go hunting and everybody that hunts on a property, when they get done for that day, they just record the day, the date, how many hours they hunted, and then how many bucks, does, and fawns they saw. And they can record other things, whether it's coyotes or bobcats or bears or whatever it is, if they want. But by recording the number of deer they observe, at the end of the year, you can develop a deer observed per hour. Okay. So we use that. I have, we have a lot of friends and family that hunt our farm. Um, and that's one of the requirements. You're going to give me an observation mm -hmm. for every day you hunt. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the year, I literally have literally thousands of hours of wow. observation data. But then from that, we can estimate, hey, are we recruiting more fawns today than we were last year or mm -hmm. five years ago? Mm -hmm. And, you know, to now we observe, you know, one deer per hour where we used to observe 10 deer per hour or right. whatever the case. Yep. So it's a measure of deer density. Yep. Um, but it's also a really good measure of productivity of that deer herd. It's the single best way to estimate how many fawns are being recruited into the system. Right. So that's why I'm a huge fan. It's yep. free. Mm -hmm. It doesn't cost anything. And uh, it's it's very easy to get. So yep. the, the, I strongly encourage people to, to, to do those. Cool. Cool. Now, do you, I've seen some uh, guidance to capture like lactation data from harvested deer. You can also have, you mentioned the kidney fat and things like mm -hmm. that. Wait, keeping track of the weights of your, of your deer. Um, do you look at lactation status? Do you like to capture that data? Is that I something do. helpful? Yep. Um, all the deer that we shoot, we will end up getting, you know, a dressed weight for. Mm -hmm. um, we get, we say the jawbone. So I age all those deer so that we can tie all the data that we collect to an age class. So we have ages. We always get a dressed weight. Um, and on does, we mark whether they're lactating or not, which is literally just, hey, is there any presence of milk in the udder? Mm -hmm. Because that's another measure of fawn recruitment rates. So, you know, when the deer comes and when we're done, we literally can get all of that in less than five minutes. And that's the information that we can use then to be much better managers, meaning shooting the appropriate number of antlerless deer each year. That's what keeps us from shooting too few or too many. Right. You know, we don't want to shoot too many and drive a deer herd low either. Right. So collecting that information is what makes sure that, yeah, we're taking, you know, the, the appropriate number. And that, yeah. that appropriate number has a range around it. So it's not like, oh, you could only take three, you took four. Yeah. No, it's like, hey, do we shoot one or do we shoot 10? Yeah. Or, you know, is it five or 20 or where is it in between? Right. So that's what makes sure that we're, we're not taking too many. But yeah. at the same time, we are taking enough so that everybody's getting enough to eat. Yeah, very much an art, as much an art as oh. a science, because there's, there's so much uncertainty with these wild yeah. animals. They're moving on to the property. They're moving off the property. You have, they're yeah. so dynamic. There's disease issues. There's, there's so much predation comes in. So, mm. uh, yeah, it's, it's hard, but just getting in that ballpark is, is the good thing yeah. to aim for. With and that. that's the fun part. Yeah. Like, I would do things a little differently where I am than you do here, a little bit different than the neighbor five miles away, but... If it was exactly the same everywhere, then it wouldn't be any fun. Right. You know, right. Right? Part of the fun of it is 
you know, we have the ability to influence it a little bit different wherever that environment might be. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's why it's, it's so appealing to people and my, why it's so much fun. That's why, why this hunting, is our profession. Why, yeah. That's and right. also why hunting this is why something we, is like hunting is, exactly. is something that's highly uncertain that you're going to see something out yeah, there. And, exactly. Uh, yeah. Um, cool. Now I think the fourth, did we hit all, are we, are we in the fourth one is hunter management? Mm -hmm. Is that where we're, we're covering next? I think that's yeah. the last one. Yeah. yeah. So what do you, um, how do you I, uh, think about, um, we, I think a great opportunity for this property is, uh, mentored hunts and thinking about engaging youth and people who haven't ever had a chance to go hunting, but they've wanted to, they've never had access to land. Um, I think there's great opportunities here for getting some great quality hunts for mm -hmm. people. Um, what um, we, we talked about the data that they should be collecting, but what other how the things should people think about if they're going to have hunters on the property and start a hunt club or want to improve their hunt club, maybe make it a little bit better? How would you introduce um, some different rules or different aspects to make it the best? I think one of the things today that's important with the hunter management part is that fortunately, the average hunter today is far more knowledgeable about deer, mm -hmm. how they see, how they move, the navigate the landscape, what they eat. Um, they're much more engaged with the state wildlife agency, which is a very good thing. So those, those are a really good piece. And, and I'll say probably a lot in part to, to the mm. work of QDMA and mm. NDA, you guys have great communication oh. staff and like get the word out about a lot oh. of this stuff. So if you, if anybody's here and needs to, wants to mm. bone up on that and isn't aware, like I'm not, I don't oh. quite know, go to NDA's website. They're chock full mm. of like free content. Uh, it's top-notch stuff. So um, you guys have done a lot on that. So, but, but go ahead. Yeah. Well, well, thank you for that. And, and that's certainly what we want is to be able to provide that information, you know, that, that hunters want. So um, I think that we're in a good place with that relative to the amount of information that's available to them and, you know, and how many hunters are consuming it. So as far as with this, I think this is a perfect scenario for mentored hunts, youth hunts, as well as mentored adult hunts. Mm -hmm. um, and then with that, having the expectation that hey as we're teaching you to do this you know this is not just about big antlers and killing big bucks this is about being hunters and being responsible stewards where you know we have the ability to shoot nice bucks but at the same time we have the responsibility to be shooting a bunch of antlerless deer as well and the, the nice thing today with many new hunters is that if they're taught from the, an early age that yes we need to shoot antlerless deer and in, in many cases we need to shoot more antlerless deer than we do bucks that just becomes part of the mantra. And it's something that as hunters, we're the champions of society by managing something so the society doesn't have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. So new hunters more than ever understand that. So I think that that is a good opportunity here, particularly given the number of deer that are here. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the, the cherry on top of all that is that meat ends up in somebody's freezer and then, on, you know, on somebody's table, that mm -hmm. high quality food that people want anyway. So yeah. we remove deer from an environment that has too many, which makes the habitat better deer and other wildlife benefit you know we do it free as hunters mm -hmm. we put money into the system to manage all those wildlife species mm -hmm. and then us our friends other families get to eat that so it just doesn't get any better than right. that that's perfect that's, right. that's a perfect circle right and there are so many oh. people interested in venison these mm -hmm. days i i've even thought i know there's we have a great program here mm -hmm. as hunters and farmers feeding the hungry mm -hmm. where they can donate their venison um if, if you take if you need to take out a lot of antlerless does mm -hmm. and you can't antlers do and you can't eat them all you can donate them to, to food kitchens other mm. places as well um and you know there's there's even people um people from from town who would love to just come pick one up mm. and so you can donate to people yeah. that way there's so many people that are interested in deer i've never found uh too many people who are, have trouble finding a way to get rid mm. of their uh their venison so Maryland does have one of the best state programs with the farmers and hunters feeding the hungry relative to hunters being able to just drop that off, not pay for it, right. you know, because hunters are more willing to harvest an additional antlerless deer if they don't have to pay to have a process. Right. And then, well, my young son is a perfect example. We, he has been invited down to Maryland the last three years, hunting early in the, or in the bow season. Uh, but where the expectation is anything we get, you know, goes to this place and it's donated. So it's a great lesson for him to help others. Um, so anyway, yeah. he has removed deer that the landscape benefits because they're gone. Mm -hmm. People who aren't hunters who wouldn't have had the meat got it otherwise. Yeah. So there's a lot of states that could emulate just what you have here. Right. And it's the financial end that makes it really work. So anyway, well, they, you guys have a good model. They, they have it. They have it. They have had oh. funding problems mm -hmm. lately. They're not, they're not getting the same mm -hmm. funding that they used mm -hmm. to get. Um, but there's been some folks that have even, um, and this is not, this is a, a little bit working its way through the, I guess, the, not quite the courts, but in terms of like administratively, 
how it fits, but um, farmers who take deer mm -hmm. from crop damage permits, dropping it off at the at the uh, processor, and the processor holds it and keeps it until somebody somebody from the public can come and pay you the processing fee uh, okay. for that for that carcass for the deer, and then they can they're sort of gifted it. Now there's gotcha. concern in our DNR right now to figure out, well, is that getting too close to paying for a deer? Mm. And you know, there's some people, I, I sort of feel like, well, they're not actually paying for the deer. They're paying for the processing. The deer has been gifted. So, but mm. there's, there's some wiggle room there and they're still trying to work out mm. administratively, administratively how that would work. But I could see that being a great way to get yeah. deer out to the public that, that people can use. It's not going to get wasted. And, um, and, that people who want the venison can pay for the processing fee. I think That's it sounds right. like a pretty nice setup if, if it can work out. Yeah, so. I agree. No. Um, well, cool. Uh, well, we've hit the four cornerstones of, of NDA's uh, deer management. Um, any other things, you know, final words or things that you'd, you'd like to share? And I think you have an incredible opportunity here relative to, to what you ultimately decide your goals are. Um, so that's a good place to be. Yeah. And um, certainly anything that involves deer or habitat like this that we can help with, you know, definitely stay in touch with me. I am glad to help uh, with this. It'll definitely aid me given that I was on the ground here today and, you know, have a, have a better feel for exactly what it is. So uh, this is, uh, I think, has a, has a very bright future here relative to your research projects, as yeah. well as, you know, what happens from a habitat end, what happens from a, a wildlife management end. And then uh, I think there's an opportunity, you know, for others to be able to come here and get to experience some of it as well. Yeah. So uh, that, uh, I think you're going to have a lot of fun. It's uh, been super fun already. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a real honor to be able to work out here. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm excited to see where mm -hmm. it goes. And, and like you said, objectives, like what your objectives are, mm -hmm. that's probably the first place any landowner mm -hmm. should start if they've got some, some new land and they're wondering what they should do. I think one of the biggest mm -hmm. things is, yeah, read up a lot on your natural history and think about what's, uh, what species need and, and what you'd like and uh, start with your objectives because mm -hmm. that's where it, all, where it all goes from. That's right. Well, uh, thanks so much, Kip. I really appreciate you mm -hmm. coming out. It's been a pleasure to, to mm -hmm. hang out and dig into this and um, looking forward to seeing where this goes right. in the future. Sounds good. My pleasure. Yeah. Take care, man. Mm -hmm. All right. That was good.